Chapter Seven of In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter Seven. Mesopotamian Influence. Of the great rulers in Mesopotamia, both Turanian and Semitic, who stand out most distinctly in the records of this remote past, are the Turanian prince Gudea, about 4800 BC, the great Sargon I, and his son, Naram Sin, Semitic princes both, to whom the date 3800 BC is accorded, and the Arabian prince Kumarangus, or Hammurabi, the founder of the city of Babylon and contemporary with Abraham the date now given for sargon the first is three thousand eight hundred b c long before this date various families of semitic race had evidently made their appearance in the land phoenician traders from the persian gulf or nomadic tribes from the arabian borders semitic families attracted hither by the rich fertility of the mesopotamian plains these were sabaeans perhaps with faint far-off remembrance of the one god ruler and creator of the universe but now worshippers of the stars the abodes of ministering spirits at this time in sargon's reign long before the date accorded to urea the builder and the new empire arising in akkad we find the early beginnings of the assyrian people there was as yet no assyria or assyrians the ancient turanian capital of Akkad was named ushar or ashar signifying watered plain but this had not yet given its name to the region or the country sargon's new capital was again or agaid of akkad while nineveh the mighty of the coming kingdom was as yet but a collection of fishermen's huts on the swift flowing tigris as yet there was no kingdom of babylonia and no city of babylon this region was situated in the northern portion of sumir south of akkad and was at first designated by the turanian name gar danyash or kar danyash the garden of the god danyash the site of the future great capital was then called either by its more ancient turanian name tin tirka signifying tree of life or its later akkado sumerian name Kadimera, gate of God. In later times, this name translated into Semitic was Babalu, Babylon, which finally became the name of the whole Semir south of the Persian Gulf as Babylonia. At the date of Sargon of Akkad, Sumir or southern Mesopotamia was chiefly Turanian. The displacement of the Mongol peoples by the Semites in this region had not at this time obtained. That fusion of races which so distinctly distinguished the Babylonians of the latter area from the more purely Semitic Assyrians had scarcely begun. The Babylonians, as a distinct people under this name, do not make their appearance on the stage of history until over fourteen centuries later than Sargon, in the time or a little earlier than Hammurabi or Camarungus, about 2300 BC, at the date accorded to Abraham. It is probable that Semitic people had settled in this region long previous to the reign of Sargon, but it was not until the period of Hammurabi, who at first was simply king of Gar Danyash, that the Semitic element dominated in Babylonia. This powerful prince, who became in time master of all southern Mesopotamia, was the founder of the city of Babylon, from which the country and the people received the names Babylonia and Babylonians. Returning to Sargon, we find in the Ninevite remains that in this earlier time he had founded one of the most famous libraries of ancient Mesopotamia. This was at his new city of Again, or Akkad. The literature of this library was entirely based on that of ancient Sumir. It consisted completely of translations of these older books into what we may call Assyrian, or were copies of the older books in the old language of Sumir. This older language was to these Semitic Assyrians the language of the learned, the classic tongue of the time, bearing the same relation to the Assyrian as do Greek and Latin to modern literature. It was then even more important to the Semitic student, as it included all of learning which in Mesopotamia had as yet obtained literary form. These ancient texts were copied on clay tablets, with translations from the language of Semir into Semitic, either between the lines or the text in the old language in one column and the translation opposite. 
For further aids to students, vocabularies were compiled, giving Akkadian word and the Assyrian translation. Also, syllabic forms, and it is by these wonderful literary aids, especially wonderful when we consider their antiquity, that scholars of today are able to read this ancient Turanian speech as readily as the Semitic Assyrian language of Sargon's reign. The systematic methods adopted in this library are also remarkable. Doubtless, Sargon's librarians introduced ideas of their own into the arrangement of this literature, but they had evidently adopted methods long in use in the more ancient libraries of Iraq, Larsa, and other cities of southern Mesopotamia. As instances of this literary undertaking, the great work on astronomy and astrology, called the Observations of Bell, which long ages after Beorosis translated into Greek, was by order of Sargon compiled for his library. It consisted of seventy-two books, and a certain place in the library was set apart for this. These tablets were arranged and numbered according to the subject. A catalogue of these was also prepared, giving the number of the tablets as arranged under the subjects. Other literary documents from this collection are The Story of Creation in Prose and Verse, The Deluge Story, and Adventures of Idzubar, the famous Nimrod of Hebrew tradition. When the student wished for any special tablet or subject, he was required by the librarian to consult the catalogue and to write down the number of the book he wished for when it would be given to him. The librarian of today, to whom the same system and methods are so familiar, can scarcely claim these as modern improvements, but may well exclaim with the philosopher of old, there is no new thing under the sun. Another great work, prepared for the library of Sargon of Agaid, was the theological collection in three books and two hundred tablets. This consisted of magical texts and incantations from the primitive religion of Turanian Chaldea, which still held power and influence as magic and divination. It included also the literature of the later development of Sumerians into higher spiritual conceptions. This literature of the later period comprised hymns of praise, invocations to the gods, and penitential psalms which in spirit and form bear a remarkable resemblance to the confessions of the later Hebrew psalmist. Perhaps we may trace in this contact with Semitic thought and influence long before the Semites appear as an established people in the land. There are two distinct periods in the religious development of the Turanians of Chaldea, the era of shamanism or demon worship, and later Sabaeanism, the deification of the planets and the stars, or the benign influence of nature. As early as Gudea, they had entered upon this later period of religious development, and now, under the influence of Sargon, occurred a blending of these systems with Semitic conceptions which continued the established religion of the Assyrians and the Babylonians to the latest times. The latent tendencies of the Semitic mind seem to have been toward monotheism. While this did not prevent their recognition of the gods of the nations with whom they came in contact, and their frequent adoption of these as objects of worship, this tendency is yet manifest. With the later Assyrians, they united in the adoption of their national deity, Ashur, with the Moabites in Shamash, with the Hebrews in Elohim or Yahweh, and with them all, the Supreme One who united in himself the great attributes of all the gods, the creator of all things, the arbiter of all human events. The Turanian Chaldeans, on the other hand, were unreserved polytheists. Their gods were as the sands of the sea for number. Each city with its surrounding locality had its special god, and the greater the city, the greater the god, the more magnificent the temple dedicated to his worship, and the more powerful its priesthood. This was the case in the city of Ur, where Harud, or Sin, the moon god, was the local divinity. There were other moon gods in other localities, each worshipped in a special way, but the moon god of Ur was greater than all. Thus it was with the worship of Ea, the god of the deep, the local god of the more ancient Syria of Eridu, and again Anu, the sky god of Iraq. This organization of the Chaldean pantheon by Sargon was simply the orderly arrangement of these into greater and lesser divinities, the blending of these separate local cults into one general system. At the head of this pantheon was placed the Semitic Ilu, or El, signifying God, and whose name is the root word of the Hebrew Elohim and the Arabian Allah. 
next in order was the triad of great gods turanian divinities consisting of anu the sky god of eric bel or molil the local god of nippur and lord of the lower world and the last of this triad of ea of eridu the god of the great waters and creator of the akkadian race the position of these gods in this triad is explained by local circumstances at the time of this new arrangement of the chaldean deities erak was a prominent city of southern mesopotamia it had a richly endowed library perhaps the greatest collection of literary treasures at this time known in the ancient world this was greatly enlarged by sargon who perhaps from motives of policy toward this chaldean subjects thought it wisest not to enrich his library at again at the expense of this the oldest of the libraries of southern mesopotamia it is also possible that some of the literary treasures obtained by him in other decaying cities of this region may have been placed in the library at iraq for the same reason as it offered better opportunities for the safe deposit of these ancient documents at any rate we find that when the assur banipal founded his great library at nineveh many centuries later and at the ancient cities of chaldea were ransacked for their literary treasures it was at iraq that he reaped the richest harvest as suggested iraq was at the time of sargon's reformation of the gods of chaldea a populous and wealthy city it possessed a powerful priesthood devoted to the service of anu the sky god and the local god of erak it possessed a powerful priesthood devoted to the service of anu the sky god the local god of erak who for these reasons was placed first in the trinity of gods for the more ancient and sacred divinities of turanian chaldea nippur the second capital of chaldea was also at this time a wealthy and populous city here was located a temple to belus the older bel identical with malil the lord of the lower world and as the local god of nippur bel became the second god in the trinity the most ancient and sacred of all the gods of ancient chaldea ea the god of the great waters the local divinity of eridu was not to be ignored and was thus placed in the trinity of the great gods the triad thus formed represented the gods of the heavens the lower world and the great waters below this was another triad consisting of sin the moon samus the sun and vul the atmosphere then followed other gods representing visible planets and still below these a host of lesser divinities the transformation of some of these gods under semitic influence and their gradual absorption of the attributes of the older deities is a curious study in chaldean mythology it is of special interest as we find in these many familiar deities of syria palestine egypt and other countries who had their origin in ancient chaldea the prominent instance of this is the rise of bel merodach the great baal from a lesser to one of the greater gods and whose cult extended with the increase of assyrian and babylonian power when bel merodach comes first distinctly in view it is as a local god of babylon with the consolidation of all southern mesopotamia into the babylonian empire and the establishment of babylon as its capital the local god of this city waxed great with greatness and importance of his local abode this occurred under hammurabi or kamarangas founder of the city of the empire about two thousand three hundred and fifty six b c the attributes of bel merodach are various he is the son of ea the firstborn of the gods the benefactor of mankind the mediator between gods and men the warrior god who leads the forces of light like nin jirusu the god of gudea he is the lord of the pure flame who conquers and puts to flight the spirits of darkness finally assuming the attributes of samas the sun god he appears as the solar deity of babylon among the cuneiform documents in the british museum there is a group of fragments known as the assyrian epic of creation portions of these were first translated by the late george smith who directed attention to their peculiar significance other fragments have since been found and translated by mr pinches producing the epic nearly complete in its present form the poem is probably of the later days of the assyrian empire it bears within it however the embodiment of ancient babylonian legends of the origin of things and is especially remarkable in certain similarities to the hebraic account of creation 
a very great and marked contrast between these two narratives is that in one case the story of creation is told by a polytheist as the effort of many gods in the other an uncompromising monotheist who attributes the work to a decree of one supreme god the Assyrian version of that portion of the Hebrew narrative, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. In the Chaldean epic is the office of Bel Merodach. As he leads forces of light against the powers of darkness, he enters into mortal combat with a great dragon, Tiamat, the goddess of chaos and darkness. This contest all the great gods have refused to attempt in the conflict which ensues merodach is victorious vanquishing and destroying the great dragon of chaos whereupon there is great rejoicing among the great gods then they established for him the mercy seat of the mighty before his fathers he seated himself for sovereignty o merodach thou art glorious among great gods since that day unchanged is thy command and thus bel merodach the great son of ea was enthroned he never became the national god of chaldea as assur became to syria local influences were opposed to this the local deities of other important cities of southern mesopotamia more ancient and venerated maintained their hold upon the affections of their worshippers to the last this was the case with molil the local deity of nippur the second and the triad of great gods the older bel with whom mel merodach is sometimes confounded the moon god was to the latest day the favorite divinity of ur of the chaldees and so of the local deities of other sumerian cities these divinities were many of them of great antiquity they were reverenced in their special localities as nowhere else thus the indignation of the priesthoods of these local cults and of the local aristocracies may well be imagined at the attempt of nabadeus the latest king of babylon five hundred fifty five through five hundred thirty eight b c to concentrate all these local worships at the city of babylon when they saw their gods taken from their ancient shrines and gathered at babylon in the great temple of bel as subordinate gods to magnify the worship of bel their resentment ripened into secret intrigue against their king which resulted in the banishment of nabonius from his kingdom the occupation of the throne by cyrus and finally the overthrow of the babylonian empire there follows a chart depicting hieroglyphic signs and their equivalents End of section 7。Chapter 8 of In the Path of the Alphabet。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. 8 babylonian contributions this latest king of babylon is however an interesting personage to him we are indebted for many records which but for him the archaeologists of this present time would not have recovered he was a zealous restorer of ancient temples and shrines which in his day had fallen into decay through all mesopotamia this seems to have been a duty enjoined by the gods upon all kings of chaldea but whatever his motive whether as a fulfilment of religious duty or of antiquarian inclinations nabonidus is said to have undertaken these restorations to an extent no king before him seems to have attempted of famous temples rebuilded by him are those of the moon god of ur and haran also of the sun god at larsa and of sippara the custom of placing the records of the founder of an edifice in chambers or cavities in the foundations of the structure is of immense antiquity these records were inscribed generally on clay cylinders and usually ended with injunctions to any future king who might in rebuilding come upon the secret hiding place of the cylinders that these records should be replaced in their original depository with religious rites failing to do this the wrath of the gods is invoked upon his sacrilegious head. It was in this way that Nabonidus came upon some very ancient and important documents. As in all cases he followed his discoveries with the record of the event upon inscribed cylinders deposited by him in the foundations of the new structure, 
the value of these to later explorers can scarcely be estimated it was during his excavations in the foundations of the sun temple at larsa that he came upon a cylinder inscribed and deposited by humarabi or Khamragas, at the rebuilding of a more ancient temple on the same site Hammurabi states upon his cylinder that this more ancient temple was founded by Uriah or Urgur, seven hundred years before his time. On analytic tablets of Babylonian kings in the British Museum, Hammuragas is mentioned, and the date accorded to him B.C. 2315, or the end of his reign B.C. 2259, which gives the date of Uriah the builder as about 2959 B.C. The most important of the discoveries of Nabonidus was, however, the finding of the foundation cylinder of Naram-Sin, the son and successor of the great Sargon of Akkad. This occurred at the time of his restoration of the Sun Temple at Sippara, near the ancient city of Agani. Of this, Nabonidus says, I brought the sun god from his temple and placed him in another house. I sought for its old foundation stone, and eighteen cubits deep. I dug into the ground and the foundation stone of Naram-Sin, son of Sargon, which for thirty-two hundred years no king who had gone before me had seen. The sun-god, the great lord of Ibarra, let me see, even me. Before the discovery of the cylinder of Nabonidus, the date of Sargon of Akkad was uncertain, he had often been regarded as identical with the later Sargon, the Assyrian king, who carried the ten tribes of Israel into captivity about 722 BC. The numerous records remaining of the earlier Sargon had made the identity of these two monarchs confusing and impossible, which was cleared away by the discovery of the records of Nabonidus. This king had data for his statements which subsequent discoveries have confirmed, thus giving to Naram-Sin the date of 3250 years before Nabonidus, which was 550 BC, and allowing for the long reign of Sargon I, we have the immense antiquity of BC 3800 for the time of the great Sargon of Akkad. The site where this important discovery was made is one of the two Separas, situated on opposite sides of the Royal Canal, not far from the Euphrates, and running parallel with the river. These two cities were anciently known by their rival sanctuaries, the one dedicated to the worship of the sun, and the other to the worship of the moon, and were known as the Separa of the sun and the Separa of Anuit. The Separa of Anuit is the supposed site of the ancient Agade of Sargon. It was, however, at Separa of the sun that Naram-Sin, the son of Sargon, founded the temple which was discovered by Nabonidus and rediscovered by Mr. Rassam a few years ago. While making excavations in a mound near the supposed site of Sippara, Mr. Rassam made his way into some rooms of a vast structure which he found to be a temple. Passing on from room to room, he at last entered a smaller chamber which was paved with asphalt. As this kind of pavement was unusual in Babylonian and Assyrian structures, he concluded this must be the secret depository of records. Having broken into the pavement, he came finally upon a sealed casket or chest of earthenware about three feet below the surface, in which was found a stone tablet, beautifully inscribed, and also other documents. This stone tablet was the archive of the famous Sun Temple, as was proved by the inscription on it, and also by the documents found with it, which gave the names of the founder and the restorers of the temple. The tablet had upon it a representation of the sun-god, seated upon a throne, receiving the homage of his worshippers, while above him the sun-disc is suspended as from heaven by two strong cords held up by two ministering spirits. The inscription declares this to be the image of Shamash, the great lord who dwells in the house of the sun, which is within the city of Sippara. This established at once the site as that of ancient Sippara, which to this time had been doubtful, 
and may lead to further discoveries of still greater antiquity on the site of the Sipara of Anuit, the supposed site of the ancient Aganu. In the records remaining of Sargon, from various localities, it is stated that he built here a palace, which, after some important military campaigns, he greatly enlarged, that he built also a magnificent temple to Anuit, and that afterwards a statue of him, Sargon, was here erected, inscribed with memorials of his birth and career. The tablets in the British Museum containing these records are probably copies of these older inscriptions, the originals not having as yet been discovered. They record Sargon's invasions of Elam, with victorious armies, another successful campaign in Syria, the subjugation of all Babylonia, and the peopling of his new city Agane, with the conquered nations. His longest and greatest campaign was a later invasion of Syria, at which he was absent from his kingdom for three years. At this time he penetrated to the sea of the setting sun, the Mediterranean, conquering all the countries through which he passed. In the rocky cliffs of the Asian shore he left inscriptions recording his triumphs, and memorial statues of him were erected in various places. It is possible that he crossed to Cyprus, where relics of him and of his son, Naram Sin, have been found. He seems to have had ambitions of universal empire, and it is stated that after his return from this expedition, he appointed that all places should form a single kingdom. Of this he says, quote, Forty-five years the kingdom I have ruled, and the black Akkadian race I have governed. End quote. Also, in multitude of bronze chariots I rode over rugged lands. Three times to the coast of the Persian Sea I advanced. The countries of the sea of the setting sun I crossed. In the third year at the setting sun my hand conquered. Under one command I caused them to be only fixed. End quote. Naram Sin, the beloved of Sin, the moon god, continued the military advances of his father. The records remaining state that he invaded Egypt and held in possession for a time Magana, the land of Magan, the region of the turquoise and copper mines, and of the famous diorite. A vase discovered at Babylon, and since lost in the Tigris, has on it the inscription, To Naram Sin, King of the Four Races, Conqueror of Apirac and Magan. A second alabaster vase was found by Monsieur de Sarasac in the ruins of Tel Lo, having inscribed on it the words Naram Sin, King of the Four Regions, or King of the North, South, East and West. This vase was embedded in the masonry, evidently later restorations of the earlier buildings of Gudia. A cylinder found by General Kesnola at Cyprus has on it an inscription declaring its owner as a worshipper of Naram Sin, who it seems had been defiled by his subjects. In the first volume of Babylonian inscriptions found at Nippur, Professor Hilfrecht records six inscriptions of Sargon, two brick stamps of baked clay, fragments of many vases, and three door sockets, most of these temple offerings to Bel Mulil of Nippur. The door sockets contain the longest inscriptions of Sargon thus far known. There are many inscriptions of Naram Sin in the Nippur remains, and yet more now in course of translation. These refer again to the restoration by these kings of the Temple of Bel and their dominion over the whole of South Babylonia. As these explorations are yet in progress, it is too early to indicate the farther evidences of these early rulers of Babylonia remaining at Nippur. The various localities in which these relics have been found indicate the extensive sway of these monarchs. They suggest also the period when certain gods of Chaldea were adopted by the various nations and people conquered by Sargon or Naram Sin. Sinai, the mountain of Sin, the moon god, may be a reminiscence of the invasion of Arabia by Naram Sin, directed by this divinity. Mount Nebo, the mountain upon which Moses died, received its name from the Chaldean Nebo, 
the god of science and literature, the god of wisdom and prophecy, Istar, the evening star, the Chaldean Venus, the goddess of love and fertility, became the Atthar of southern Arabia, is identical with the goddess Hathor of Egyptian mythology, and was worshipped by the Canaanites as Ashtaroth, and finally by the Greeks as Astarte. Against this background of history and tradition, of civilization so remote, a notable figure appears about 1540 years later than the great Sharukin, or 2260 BC, in whom the most sacred traditions of later civilizations were to have their rise. This was Abraham, or Abu Ramu, the exalted father with whom the history of the people of Israel begins. A Semite and a native of Ur, his historical position is an important landmark in the story of letters. Of special significance in this connection is this early contact of Abraham and his family with the land and people of Chaldea, the lingering survivals of Akkadian speech and traditions in Hebrew language and literature. Again, when Abraham left Chaldea to found a great nation in another land, writing and literature could not have been unknown to him. The constant use of cruniform signs in architectural structures, in business forms, and in every department of social and industrial life, and the ever-present schools for scribes in all the great cities of Mesopotamia, made this impossible. The art of writing was no new thing to this young Semite prince. It was an art even then hoary with age. With all to whom Abraham is a historic personality, the story of his life and times, as recorded in the biblical narrative, is illuminated as never before in the testimony of these cruniform documents from old Chaldea. The biblical narrative does not touch upon the causes which led Abraham away from the land of his nativity. Jewish and Arabian traditions, however, state, and there may be a grain of truth in these traditions, that this was the result of the revolt of Abraham against the idols of Ur, and his refusal to acknowledge them as divine, that this brought upon him and his father's family a storm of persecution from the priests and people, which ended in their banishment from Ur, and their departure for a distant country. The references in the scripture narrative to Terah, the father of Abraham, as an idolater, and the Arabian tradition as a sculptor or maker of idols, is significant in these connections. The destination of this family was Haran, at that time a Turanian city in northern Mesopotamia, an important frontier station on the high road to Syria and Palestine, and the various roads to the fords of the Tigris and Euphrates. The word Haran is from the Arcadian Haran, a road, and was thus named for its position. It is said to lie in a region of exceeding fertility and beauty. Its fine free air and commanding views make it the delight of the Bedouin tribes who find here luxuriant pasturage for innumerable flocks and herds. Previous to the time of Abraham, there seems to have been at Haran, and in the region round about, a considerable colony of Semitic people, as indicated by Assyrian inscriptions. Since Abraham's date, Nahor's city and the well of Rebekah, located near Haran, bear these ancient names to the present day. The deity of Haran was then the moon god, the same deity as worshipped at Ur, always a favourite divinity with all Semitic people, and which might have been an influence that drew Terah there. During the remaining years of Terah's life, Abraham remained in this locality, prospering greatly, but with his father's death his long-conceived purpose of establishing himself in Canaan was finally achieved. After Abraham's arrival in Canaan with his numerous household, his princely retinue and his great possessions, we find him again in contact with certain Babylonian princes who have invaded Canaan and have obtained sovereignty in various localities. The fourteenth chapter of Genesis gives account of the battle of Abraham with these kings of Babylonia for the rescue of Lot his nephew, in which he put the invaders to flight, establishing peace and security in the land. The names of these kings, as given in the scripture narrative, are Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, 
Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elasser, or Larsa, and Tidal, king of nations. These kings are now identified by Babylonian records, Cheldolaomer, king of Elam, as Kudur Lagomar, an Elamite king of that date, Arioch, king of Elasser, with Eri Aku, then king of Larsa. Amraphel, king of Shinar, is identified as Hammurabi, or Hammuragus, and Tidal, king of nations, as Thorgal, king of Gutium, a region to the north of Elam. The evident correspondence of these kings with Abraham's contemporaries furnish continued evidence of the political contacts of Babylonia and Canaan from the earliest times, and in many ways confirm the historical verities of the early scripture records. Another document reflecting new light from the cuneiform inscriptions is the last exhortation of Joshua to Israel, assembled at Shechem. In the review he then gives of the history of his people, he says, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, the Euphrates, in the old time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, and I gave them into your hand. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. The whole discourse bears internal evidence of a written report, fresh from the voice of the speaker. We now know that the functions of the scribe were as constantly employed as the modern reporter through all Babylonia and Assyria, as well as Egypt, at these early dates. Moses, who was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, evidently had no lack of scribes among the Israelites. The Tel el Amarna tablets give evidence of the general practice of the art of writing through all Canaan before the days of Moses and Joshua. We have thus little need to refer to the period of the Babylonian captivity for the appearance of Akkadian and Aramean words in early Hebrew history, or for the correspondences of Chaldean legends with scripture records. The origin of the documents which in Ezra's time were collected and rewritten in new form were historical remnants surviving from the earlier periods to which they are assigned in history and tradition. There follows a depiction of hieroglyphic signs. The order both of the columns and the hieroglyphs is from left to right. Verbally translated it reads, I am a Lord excellent, very beloved ruler. Loving his country passed I for years as the ruler of Sa. The work all of the palace was done by my hand. End of 8 Chapter 9 of In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2017. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter 9. The Semitic Assyrians and the Semitic people of other portions of Mesopotamia had adopted the cuneiform script and the Turanian syllabary as early as the days of Sargon. From this time onward, and until the days of Assyrian and Babylonian supremacy, these signs were the common medium of literary intercourse among the nations of Western Asia, and expressed various languages and dialects. The famous documents recently found in Egypt, known as the Tel el Amarna letters, indicate the extensive use of cuneiform writing in the 15th century before Christ, or about 720 years after Abraham. The story of the discovery of these documents is still another among the many romances which archaeology so constantly and so unexpectedly presents. 
the site of the modern arab village tel el amarna is about one hundred and ninety miles south of cairo on the eastern bank of the river nile the mountain chain which here follows the course of the river recedes at this point in the form of a bay and upon the sandy plain thus partially enclosed many interesting remains appear indicating the site of an ancient city the tombs on the hillside have long been of special interest to egyptologists the city was known to have been the royal residence and for a time the capital of egypt under amenophis the fourth the ninth king of the eighteenth dynasty this king son of amenophis the third and queen teye a princess of mitanni was through several generations of maternal descent more asiatic than egyptian the royal house of mitanni the aram nahiram of the hebrews had given in marriage several successive princesses to the kings of egypt Totmes the third during his wars of conquest in western asia had obtained a princess of mitanni in marriage and this alliance was further cemented by the egyptian kings his successors to the period of amenophis the third the father of kuun aten amenophis the fourth these frequent alliances had brought about an inclination for the gods of the mesopotamian mothers and after a while this younger son of the royal house of egypt openly professed his adoption of the worship of aten the supreme baal of the semitic people of asia and attempted to substitute this for the worship of amon the god of thebes he erased the name of the egyptian god from the monuments and temples wherever found this so aroused the indignation of the powerful priesthood devoted to the worship of amon that amenophis found it necessary to leave for a time the capital of his kingdom at thebes and to found another elsewhere this was established on the site of the modern tel el amarna the king took to himself a new title ku n aten the splendor of the sun's disc by which name also he designated his new city his reign after this seems to have been of short duration after him two or three princes of his house succeeded him but with him egyptian supremacy in western asia was at an end and the subject provinces of syria and palestine passed out of egyptian hands and rule the mummy of this monarch has recently been found in a royal sepulchre of the kings of thebes with those of other kings of this ancient dynasty the revolt against the heretical king was extensive and egypt was distracted with civil wars the adherents of the ancient religions soon brought the worship of the new heresy to an end and rameses first king of the nineteenth dynasty restored the worship of amon and the ancient gods of egypt with all power and dignity and brought with him a return of peace such was the aversion of the egyptian people for the capital of the heretic king that although his city was built almost entirely of sun-dried bricks it has suffered less from the ravages of time than the more solidly constructed cities of thebes and memphis pris Daven, who gives a description of the site of kun aten says that the principal streets of the city are distinct and the greater buildings can in part be traced and again that some of the buildings of sunburnt brick are the best preserved and most ancient dwellings in the valley of the nile in eighteen eighty seven some clay tablets of peculiar and foreign character were found in these ruins in company with egyptian relics these tablets resembled for the most part small pillows of clay and they were inscribed with cuneiform characters with them were found a few larger tablets some small cylinders also inscribed in cuneiform and seals and other relics with hieroglyphic inscriptions the ruins where they were found were at first supposed to have been the remains of the royal residence but further examination indicates the structure as the depository of the royal archives the abode of the king's scribe and custodian of documents it was near the palace though not of it a portion of these documents were placed in the museum at cairo some were obtained for the british museum and the remainder by the royal museum of berlin 
they include in all three hundred letters from kings of babylonia assyria mesopotamia and northern syria and from subject princes and governors in palestine and throughout canaan although in cuneiform script these characters varied with the locality from whence they came the indications are that this system of writing had been long in use throughout western asia the language chiefly used in these documents was the semitic babylonian in the syllabary of the older turanian form in one or two cases the writer uses the babylonian script to express his native language the speech of the locality from whence the letter was sent but these instances are rare in one letter from tushrata or dusrata king of mitanni the first seven lines are in assyrian but after this the remaining five hundred and five lines are in his native language the speech of mitanni a language as yet unknown having never been translated the meanings of a few words have been determined by dr sayce and other scholars and the indications are that the language was a mongol dialect akin to the akkadian the similarity of some words to those used by the hittite prince tarkondara who also writes about this time to amenophis the third indicates this to be of the same family of speech the writing of this document is syllabic and in the older cuneiform with very few determinatives in some later explorations at tel el amarna mr petrie came upon some fragments of other tablets in cuneiform which proved to be dictionaries in one case the dictionary expresses semitic babylonian and sumerian and as the sumerian words are written phonetically as well as ideographically it would appear that sumerian must have still been a living language on one of those later found tablets babylonian words are given to explain words of two other languages one of which mr boscawen thinks to be old egyptian if this is the case it is the only instance in the tel el amarna collections where this appears in no other portion of this correspondence is the language of egypt used throughout the vast region represented by these letters including various races and forms of speech from the upper euphrates to babylonia from northern syria to southern palestine everywhere the babylonian language and babylonian script were the common medium of literary intercourse in this correspondence the fact that many of these letters seem to have been individual productions and not the work of special schools of scribes indicates the widespread influence of babylonian culture and the opportunities for education existing throughout the orient in the century before the exodus there are evidences that the schools and libraries of the ancient cities of mesopotamia had their counterparts in the cities of southern palestine as for instance Kirgath Seper, the city of books, to which we find later reference as Kirgath Sane, the city of instruction. The glimpses afforded of social and political conditions in various localities at the period of this correspondence are of historical importance, furnishing data and verifying documents found elsewhere of the same persons and events. We have in the Tel el Amarna collection letters from Buraburyash and his father, kings of Kardungyash or Babylon, to Amenophis III of Egypt, in which reference is made to the Egyptian princess, sister of Amenophis, wife of the king of Babylon. Buraburyash also wants gold, much gold, from the Egyptian king for the building of his temple, and complains that this does not come to him in sufficient quantities there is one letter from the king of assyria and many letters from tushrata or dusrata king of mitanni these latter refer chiefly to the princesses of mitanni wives of the egyptian kings queen teye mother of amenophis the fourth and the princess kirgipa whose magnificent dowry occupies a great portion of some of the largest tablets in the collection the lists include horses and a chariot covered with gold ornaments of silver and gold of finest babylonian workmanship decorated with precious stones and rich garments of variegated stuffs upon the death of amenophis the third this princess became the wife of amenophis the fourth his son 
who thus continued his alliance with the powerful and wealthy Tushrata, king of Mitanni. Some of the most interesting letters in the collection are from Syria and Palestine, from the native princes and governors of cities, at this time subject to the Egyptian kings. The correspondence of Ebed Tob, priest king and governor of Jerusalem, is of special interest. Jerusalem was at this time a city of the Amorites, a Semitic people of Palestine, and its name in these documents is Uru Salim, signifying the city of the god Salem, or the god of peace. Ebed Tob impresses the fact upon his royal correspondent that though subject to the Egyptian king, he is king of Uru Salim by an oracle of the god of Salim. He was thus priest king of the city by divine appointment and not by heredity. This statement suggests that earlier king of Jerusalem, Melchizedek, who, as king of Salem and priest of the Most High God, comes forth with bread and wine and blessings for Abraham, the deliverer of the country from its foes, the restorer of peace. The Assyrian form Sar Salem, king of Salem, is identical with the Hebrew Sar Shalom, prince of peace. This again illustrates the application by Isaiah of the title of Prince of Peace to that later Prince of the House of David, who, in a higher spiritual sense than his great prototype, Melchizedek, was yet to be to all nations and people King of Salem and Prince of Peace. The most remarkable event in the history of archaeology has its connections with the Tel el Amarna discovery. Among the letters in this collection addressed to Amenophis IV from the governors of cities in southern Palestine are those from the governor of Lachish. This dignitary was named Zimrida, and his dispatches to the king of Egypt were chiefly upon the political conditions of his province, its dangers from approaching foes, and the necessity of relief from Egypt. It seems that Zimrida was in greater danger from foes within than without, for in one of the latter letters from Ebed Tob he alludes to the murder of Zimrida by servants of the Egyptian king. The discovery of these cuneiform tablets from southern Palestine had strengthened the growing convictions of Professor Zeiss that lying beneath many of the tells or mounds that marked the sites of ancient cities throughout southern Palestine, other similar treasures were buried. The name Kirgat Sefer, Book Town, was strongly suggestive, and, acting upon these impressions, he urged the Palestine Exploration Fund to undertake explorations in this region. The Tel el Amarna letters were discovered in 1887. It was not, however, until 1890 that the officers of the Palestine Exploration Fund were able to obtain the necessary permission from the Turkish government or to secure the services of the distinguished explorer Dr. Petri for the work. This gentleman began excavations in the month of April of that year. After some days of examination of various tells in this region for the site of Lachish, he decided to commence work at the tell or mound Tel El Hezi, so called from the river Hezi, which flows by the hill on which the mound is located. It is about seventeen miles to the east of Gaza. The natural eminence upon which it is situated rises to a height of forty feet above the valley. Above this, the mound consists of a succession of town levels, the one above the other, sixty feet higher, from which a commanding view of the region is obtained. Fortunately for the explorer, the turbulent stream flowing over these declivities has cut this tell on the eastern side from top to bottom, leaving the whole face exposed and revealing distinctly the various city levels of the several periods of occupation. The commanding position of the site, the fine springs of water gushing from the hillsides, and the rapid stream affording an abundance of fresh, sweet water, the locality agreeing in so many particulars with the site of ancient Lachish, the evidence is also in the hillside of the existence at various periods of ancient important cities, justified his convictions which subsequent discoveries verified. 
After some months of excavation, Dr. Petrie was obliged to discontinue his work here for engagement elsewhere, leaving further explorations in the hands of Mr. Bliss. The result of Dr. Petrie's labors had been to establish known facts in the history of ancient Lachish. The lowest and earliest town must have been of great strength and importance. The remains of the walls are twenty-eight feet and eight inches in thickness, of bricks unburnt, with two successive patchings of rebuilding, occupying thirty-nine of the sixty feet in the height of the mound. At this level the fragments of pottery were distinct and peculiar, very different from the relics of the cities above, and which, from relics elsewhere obtained, give the period of their use and manufacture at 1500 BC. The next level indicated a barbaric invasion, when rude huts were piled up, to fall soon after into ruin. After this comes successive strata of Jewish cities until about 400 BC, since which time Lachish passed out of history and no later relics are found. Of these things Dr. Petrie says, the Amorite pottery extends from 1500 BC to 1000 BC. Phoenician and Cypriot begins about 1000 and goes to 700 BC. Greek influence then begins and continues to the top of the town. Upon leaving, he pointed out to Dr. Bliss the indications that the lower portions of the tell would bring to light the ruins of a city destroyed by the invading Israelites. Among the early relics found by Mr. Bliss, when the lower stratum of cities was more thoroughly explored, were a number of Egyptian beads and scarabs of the 18th Egyptian dynasty, on one of which the name of Queen Teye, wife of Amenophis III and mother of Amenophis IV, appears. There were also a number of sealed cylinders, some of Egyptian and some of Babylonian manufacture, of the same period or earlier. The most wonderful discovery, however, was to come, verifying the predictions of Professor Zeiss and the judgment of Dr. Petri, but in a way to astonish even these eminent scholars to whom all things seem possible. This was the discovery of a clay tablet inscribed in cuneiform characters similar in size, form, and other peculiarities to the letters from Lachish in the Tel el Amarna documents. It is written in the Babylonian language and with the Babylonian syllabary, and what is still more astonishing, the name of Zimrida appears upon it. It proves to be a letter addressed to an Egyptian officer, received at Lachish about the time Simrida's letter was sent to the king of Egypt. In this the name of Simrida, who, according to the Tel el Amarna dispatches, was governor of Lachish, is twice mentioned. Here in Canaan, deep beneath the remains of many cities, and there upon the banks of the Nile, these two fragments of a correspondence have lain through many centuries, waiting for the time when this long-forgotten story might be read and explained. The Lachish letter was claimed at once by the Turkish government, and those who have attempted its translation have been obliged to do this from squeezes or impressions of the original document, which in some cases are imperfect, as some of the characters are partly obliterated or on the edges of the tablet. Quite enough, however, is apparent to identify the date and significance of the documents. The Tel el Amarna documents also indicate in a way the date of the Exodus. They at least prove, of the periods sometimes assigned, when this could not have happened, and to point to the probabilities when it did. In the letters from southern Canaan, we have a distinct view of Palestine before its occupation by the children of Israel. They had not taken possession of Lachish, nor had they entered Jerusalem. At this time, Palestine and all Syria were under Egyptian domination. The governors of many of the cities were oftentimes native Egyptians, and Egyptian garrisons were stationed at all important points for their protection. From the time of Totmes III of the 18th dynasty to the close of the reign of Amenophis IV, this state of affairs had continued, 
and during this period no egyptian king corresponds to the pharaoh of the oppression at the time of the invasion of canaan by the israelites and their occupation of its cities the domination of egypt had ceased this did not occur until the close of the eighteenth dynasty when the nineteenth dynasty came in with rameses i a new order of things arose the reaction against the heresies of Amenophis extended to all Asiatic influences, and the Semitic people throughout the realm found in Rameses and his immediate successors the pharaohs who knew not Joseph. Again, in certain of these letters from southern Palestine, there are references to the Kabiri, who were threatening these cities, and in the Kabiri some scholars read the word Hebrews and their approaching invasion of Palestine these would place these letters at the close of the wandering in the wilderness instead of earlier against this view is urged that the political conditions of canaan at the time of this correspondence do not agree with those of the israelitish invasion of canaan the word kabiri signifies confederates they are probably the people of hebron one of the old amorite cities and confederated against the alien egyptian authorities with their stronghold at Hebron. In the letters of Ebed Tob to the king of Egypt, he complains of certain officials in the neighboring cities who are conspiring with the Kabiri, the most dangerous foe to the constituted authorities in that part of Palestine. The preservation of these documents among the archives of the Egyptian king show that these appeals were received. The evidences are that they were sent to Amenophis IV near the close of his reign. Then civil war, which continued for some time after his death, and during the reign of his immediate successors, made it necessary to recall the Egyptian troops abroad, and the strongholds of Egyptian rule in Asia soon surrendered to native and foreign claimants of Syria and Canaan. It is scarcely possible in so brief a sketch to give an estimate of things indicated or the historical importance of these documents the most striking of the things indicated is the large range presented of babylonian influence and culture this is not more noticeable in the countries bordering upon the euphrates valley than it is throughout the region lying along the eastern coast of the mediterranean and the western slopes of amanus from northern Syria to the valley of the Nile. From Tyre and Sidon, Beirut and Joppa, Gaza and Ascalon, Jerusalem, Lachish and other ancient cities of Syria, Palestine and Canaan, letters were addressed to the king of Egypt, not in the language of Egypt, nor yet of Syria or Canaan, but in the language and script of Babylonia. This is hardly what might have been expected. We might have expected, for instance, the speech of the Semitic people of Syria or Canaan, this older Hebrew, to have assumed Hebraic forms, that older Phoenician script for which scholars are so earnestly searching. Or we might reasonably have supposed that documents from this region and at this time would have been expressed in the written forms of the hieroglyphic system of Egypt, but this was not the case. The problem of the use at this date of the script and language of Babylonia by the Semitic people of Syria and Canaan must be referred to the extensive influence of Babylonian culture and power, which had been more or less dominant in Canaan from the period of Sargon I. Of this, Professor Zeis says, So long had this system of writing been adopted in Western Asia, and so long had it had its home there that each district and nationality had time to form its peculiar hand. We can tell at a glance, by merely looking at the forms assumed, whether a particular document came from the south of Palestine, from Phoenicia, or from northern Syria. Again, the prevalence of its use throughout the vast region represented by these documents, from the Persian Gulf to the mountains of Armenia, from beyond the Tigris to the Mediterranean Sea, and from northern Syria to Arabia, implies the centuries. It indicates that what our alphabetic system is to modern civilizations, the Babylonian cuneiform was to the civilizations of Western Asia in the century preceding the Exodus. 
another influence for the persistency and spread of the cuneiform writing was due to the great libraries established in various cities to which the people had access these had existed from the earliest times in babylonia and undoubtedly spread with the spread of babylonian influence and culture of legendary libraries in chaldea berus's tells of the antediluvian city panta bibla town of books and sipara also city of the sun where sisterus the chaldean noah buried his books before the deluge and from whence they were disentombed after the subsidence of the waters of actual collections literary remains from the library of Erech, the most ancient of chaldean cities give evidence of the antiquity of these institutions as also others from cutha larsa and various localities the library of larsa or senkere was famous for its mathematical works and here students of that science came from all parts of the country some tablets from this library are now in the british museum among which are tablets of squares and there are traces of a chaldean euclid with geometrical figures in assyria the great libraries established in various cities were at the expense of the libraries of babylonia they were founded by the kings of assyria who became for the time masters of babylonia for the enrichment of assyria the babylonian libraries were despoiled of many treasures of which such books were selected and removed as would add to the glory of assyria the books of the assyrian libraries established in various cities consisted either of works from the older libraries or were copies of books left in their original homes the most ancient of the assyrian libraries of which we have account after that of the great sargon of argain was that of kela this city was founded by shalmaneser about one thousand three hundred b c but later on was laid waste during some invasions of assyria it was afterwards rebuilt by assur nazi pal king of assyria 885 bc at this restoration of kela he founded the celebrated library in which with other literature was deposited the great work on astronomy entitled the observations of bel this work was first composed for the library of sargon at again and throughout assyrian and babylonian history had a wide reputation it was translated in later times into greek by berosus the chaldean historian from many copies of the work made for the great library of asurbani pal at koyunjik many fragments of these copies are now in the british museum but the table of contents which remains gives a good conception of the subjects treated in the original work Asurbani Pal says of the founding of this royal library that, inspired by Nebo, the prophet god of literature, and his wife Tasmit, the bearer, he had regard to the engraved characters of which, as much as was suitable on tablets, he had written and explained and placed in his library for the inspection of his subjects. To this library, strangers from all countries were also admitted and for their assistance in the study of literature and the translation of these documents syllabaries were prepared in which the cuneiform characters were classified and arranged with these were the phrase books and dictionaries presenting the ancient akkadian form of the word with its assyrian equivalent by these means the modern student of cuneiform has been able to translate this long forgotten language as readily as the student of the period of Asur Bani Pal. Like testimony from other localities is coming to light of the literary activity which prevailed for long centuries, we may say millenniums, throughout the vast region affected by Babylonian influence. There were books and libraries everywhere, and those who could read and write them the imperishable nature of these baked clay records is yet to furnish other and greater surprises beneath the mounds which dot the plains and valleys of mesopotamia syria and palestine the treasures of many ancient libraries undoubtedly still await the spade of the explorer end of chapter nine
Chapter Ten of In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2018. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter Ten Proto Medic Alphabet throughout the whole history of cuneiform writing with the babylonians and assyrians it continued a syllabic system there was no development with them of alphabetic characters the first evidences we have as yet of such development through this cuneiform was at the time when the medes an aryan people related to the persians received from the primitive or earlier inhabitants of media their system of writing these proto-medic tribes were a Turanian people of ural altaic stock speaking an agglutinative language their system of writing was the cuneiform and had been a development from the semitic babylonian script in the adaptations of this to the requirements of an agglutinative speech a process of simplifying had occurred quite similar to that which the japanese present upon the transmission to them of the graphic system of the chinese the semitic babylonian system which was originally adopted from the cuneiform of a turanian people had developed a complicated and cumbrous method of writing including over five hundred signs this had arisen in the attempts to adapt the syllabary and characters expressing an agglutinative speech to the uses of a semitic language it was from this that the persian cuneiform was derived and in the further simplicity which appeared in the transmission of this to an aryan people and its applications to an aryan speech that we find a development towards alphabetism with the adoption of the protomedic cuneiform by the medes and persians many of the syllabic signs instead of representing syllables came on the acrologic principle to be used as alphabetic characters as certain of these signs retained a syllabic character the persian cuneiform was never a pure alphabet though far on the way to this as early as the period of the achaemenian kings dr taylor says of this Quote, the idea of alphabetism may not improbably have been suggested to the persians by their acquaintance with the phoenician alphabet which as early as the eighth century b c was used in the valley of the euphrates concurrently with cuneiform writing End quote. at the date of the persepolitan and behistun inscriptions and during the two previous centuries the aramean alphabet daughter of the phoenician had been a commercial script of the semitic people of northern mesopotamia and syria at the time of darius it was used at the courts of the assyrian kings in official records and later on at babylon again upon the decline of the assyrian and babylonian empires and with these the decadence of the cuneiform this was superseded by the aramean alphabet of this however later on whatever influences the alphabet of aram may have had in suggesting the idea of alphabetism to the originators of the persian cuneiform the result was original and distinct of this persian cuneiform which has furnished the key to the decipherment of all cuneiform the fullest vocabulary has been found in the behistun inscriptions the rock on which these are engraved is situated near the western frontier of persia on the direct route from babylon to ecbatana it rises an isolated mountain from the plain to a height of seventeen hundred feet on one side is a sheer wall of precipitous rock at its base is a copious fountain on one of the great highways of travel its isolated position and peculiar features have made this a notable landmark throughout the ages at the northern extremity of this escarpment in a recess to the right are the famous inscriptions of darius son of hystapes to make these inaccessible to foreign invaders or domestic foes they were placed about three hundred feet above the base of the rock sir henry rawlinson who first deciphered these inscriptions attempted the work by the aid of powerful field glasses 
but later succeeded in obtaining a closer inspection by means of ropes let down from the cliffs at great expense and at the risk of his life the wonder is how the engravers could have done the work the rock was beautifully polished before inscribed and in some places where there were inequalities of surface pieces of the rock were fitted in and fastened with molten lead this was done with such delicacy that only by close and careful scrutiny can it be detected after the engraving had been completed a fine coat of silicious varnish was laid over to give clearness of outline to each letter and to protect the surface against the action of the elements of the inscriptions sir henry rawlinson says for beauty of execution for uniformity and correctness they are unequalled the purpose of king darius in these memorials was to set forth to his subjects his hereditary right to the throne of persia and the glories of his reign i am darius he says the great king the king of kings the king of persia the king of nations and then after giving the record of his genealogy back to achaemenes the first of his line he says there are eight of my race who have been kings before me i am the ninth in a double line we have been kings the inscriptions consist of a thousand lines in three columns and in three languages an Aryan, a Turanian, and a Semitic speech. The first column, addressed to the Persian people of his realm, was written in the Persian cuneiform, with thirty-six alphabetic signs and but four ideograms. The second was to the Protomedic, or as now called, Scythic inhabitants of the kingdom, and was written in the Turanian cuneiform, with ninety-six pure syllabic signs accompanied by seven surviving ideograms the third version to the assyrian or semitic subjects of the persian king was inscribed in the semitic babylonian cuneiform including five hundred characters after the discovery by grotefend of the key to the decipherment of the persian cuneiform sir henry rawlinson an english military officer in the service of the east india company while on duty in persia undertook the study of cuneiform characters this he attempted independently with no one to aid him as at this time he was not acquainted with the discoveries of grotefend or the methods pursued by him the greater simplicity of the persian versions in the trilingual inscriptions suggested less difficulties to overcome and led him to pursue the same lines by which grotefend had previously obtained success sir henry rawlinson was able to carry forward the decipherment of cuneiform much farther than grotefend owing partly to the better knowledge of the ancient languages of persia attained at this time and partly to the fact that he had escaped the mistakes which obstructed grotefend in his later decipherments of cuneiform it will be remembered that grotefend discovered the true values of twelve of the forty-eight letters of the persian alphabet further than this he did not go he made the mistake of supposing all the vowel sounds were expressed in this system which is not the case with some of the consonants the vowel sound is inherent and is not written with an independent sign this mistake prevented his further progress but his success had pointed the way and a host of eager and able scholars at once entered this new field of oriental philology the most promising direction seemed to be the zend the so-called language in which the sacred books of the parsees was written of this but one or two fragments known to be genuine were at this time to be found in the libraries of europe one in the bodleian library chained to the wall and here and there a few stray leaves of Zend manuscript in other collections. In the year 1771, a work had been deposited by its author, Anquetil du Perron, which he claimed to be a translation from the original Zend Avesta, with copy of the texts. The work had been pronounced a forgery by certain distinguished scholars, but the well-known scholarship of its author held the judgments of other learned philologists in abeyance 
the story of this effort is of romantic interest while a youth preparing for priesthood in the seminaries of paris he became so absorbed in the study of language that he gave himself entirely to these pursuits abandoning his intentions of the study of theology while thus engaged some stray leaves of a zend manuscript came into his hands which so filled his minds with the desire to read the language of the parsees that he determined to do so at this time the conflicting interests of the english and french in india reached a crisis enlisting as a private soldier in the french army he was about to sail for india when the officers of the institute to which he was attached affected by his zeal for learning obtained from the minister of war a free passage for him to pondicherry with a seat during the voyage at the captain's table and a salary to be paid him on his arrival in india while he carried on his studies after reaching pondicherry he began the study of sanskrit and arabic and later on through great hardship finally reached surat here he obtained the confidence of certain parsee priests who permitted him access to their sacred books and through whose assistance he acquired sufficient knowledge of the language in which they were written to enable him to translate the zend avesta returning to paris in seventeen sixty two with over a hundred precious manuscripts he obtained a small post in the royal library where he spent the next nine years in the preparation of his copies of the original texts of the zend avesta translating these for publication in seventeen seventy one the work was completed and he had the satisfaction of placing in the royal library of paris the first authentic version of the zend avesta and the first translation that had ever appeared in any european language as before stated many scholars of the time were not prepared for the work denying its authenticity and proclaiming it an audacious forgery under this cloud the intrepid author of this work conscious of the importance of his contribution to learning undaunted by the fate which so long delayed the just recognition of his labours passed the remainder of his days in cheerful resignation he lived to congratulate grotefend upon his achievements in the decipherment of cuneiform and died shortly after in eighteen o eight at the advanced age of seventy seven twenty years later the honours due his name came through the researches of the illustrious scholars rask and burnoff who proved this great work of anquetil du perron to be a genuine if not correct translation of the zend avesta as obtained through the sacred books of the parsees it was by a study of this translation that the key to the ancient persian language was obtained and has since served an important use in the study of zend philology footnote this use of the word zend is incorrect as referring to the language in which the works of zoroaster appear there is no zend language End footnote. notwithstanding its value this translation of the zend avesta was by no means perfect the faulty teachings of the parsi priests led the author into occasional errors which obstructed the progress of later scholars who depended too closely upon it for results little by little however from the work of sir henry rawlinson on the behistun inscriptions through the researches of bernouf in the original zend manuscripts again from testimony furnished by other distinguished scholars from coins and other inscriptions and still again by a comparative study of sanskrit modern persian and arabic all the letters of the old persian cuneiform have been obtained until now it is as easily and distinctly read as greek or hebrew it is impossible within these limits to follow the steps by which these important results were obtained the methods employed in such researches are often only intelligible to philologists themselves in this special study the epigraphic materials examined included not only cuneiform signs but characters representing the fully developed alphabets of later periods alphabets which had superseded the cuneiform as systems of writing though expressing the ancient speech of persia the most ancient copies of the zend avesta are only to be found in pehlevi characters 
a Persian alphabetic system of the Sasanian period, dating from the 3rd century AD. The Pehlevi alphabets are direct descendants of the Aramean alphabet, a daughter of the older Phoenician, which had developed in the highlands of Aram, or Upper Mesopotamia, before the Achaemenian period in Persia. The Aramean language originally expressed by these characters was at this time one of the most widely spoken of the Semitic dialects, including the idioms of Syria, Aram, and Assyria. At first, as a commercial and literary script, it came to be extensively used in these and adjacent countries conjointly with the cuneiform. In the ruins of ancient Nineveh, there are the remains of what must have been a public registry office. From this, a great number of terracotta tablets have been exhumed, on which were inscribed in cuneiform characters records of legal contracts, including loans of money, sales of estates and exchanges of other properties. Many of these tablets were docketed on the sides or edges in Aramean or Phoenician letters, by which the subject of each document could be readily found when piled on the shelves or in recesses where they were deposited. Reference in some of these appears from the time of Tiglat Pileser and Sennacherib, 741 to 681 BC. Other evidences of the extensive use of this script comes from the later Assyrian kings and from Babylonia until the decline of these empires, 606 to 538 BC. After the conquests of Babylonia by the Persians, the Aramean alphabet gradually became the official script of these regions, finally supplanting the cuneiform. Of historic documents of this period in the Aramean script and language was the royal decree given by Artaxerxes to Ezra for the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem. The Aramean was the language spoken at this time by all the Semitic people of Babylonia. It is probable that during the whole period of the Achaemenids, a local variety of the Aramean alphabet was in general use as a cursive script throughout the empire. The perishable materials used for this purpose, as the bark of trees, skins, papyrus, unbaked clay, etc., have furnished but few remains of this form of writing, but that it existed and was in extensive use at this date, there are unmistakable evidences. It is not impossible that the works of Zoroaster may have been so written in the old Bactrian, as Darius Hystaspus states in the Median text of the Behistun inscription, that he has made a book in the Aryan language which before him did not exist. The text of the Divine Law, Avesta, the Prayer and the Translation and then this ancient book was restored by me in all nations, and the nations followed it. End quote. The inscription of King Asoka at Kaipur Digiri on the northern and western confines of India is evidently a survival of this ancient script. About 500 BC, the Punjab was invaded by the Persians under Darius and during the remaining period of the Achaemenian kings continued the satrapy of Persia. After the conquests of Alexander, and later of the decline of Greek rule, this province was restored to India. About 251 BC, Asoka, then king of India, an earnest and devout believer in Buddha, ordered certain edicts to be inscribed in various parts of his empire. These are known as the Fourteen Edicts of Asoka. The type of the alphabetic character employed in the various localities differs. Those used at Kapur di Giri are in a cursive script from the Aramean and are often designated the Bactrian alphabet from its close relationship to these early Iranian forms. Of this, Dr. Taylor says, quote, the Kapur di Giri record must be regarded as an isolated monument of a great Bactrian alphabet in which the Zoroastrian books and an extensive literature were in all probability conserved. End, quote. End of section 10. Chapter 11 of In the Path of the Alphabet. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter 11 Zoroaster and Mohammed. For monumental purposes, the Persian cuneiform remained the official script of the empire conjointly with the Semitic Scythian cuneiform until the conquest of Persia by Alexander the Great, about 334 BC, with which the period of the Achaemenids closed. Immediately following this, the use of the Greek alphabet appears on coins and inscriptions, and this continued during the Greek domination in Persia under the successors of Alexander. The early Arsacids, the Parthian kings who brought an end to the rule of the Greeks in Persia, used also for a time the Greek alphabet for monumental records and numismatic legends. This, however, only lasted for a brief period, for a little later on we find that the Greek letters have given way to a variety of the Aramean alphabet, which evidently had been in general use for a long period as a cursive script. This special variety of the Aramean belongs to a group of alphabets known as Pelivi, and is the oldest of the group. The name Pelivi is derived from the word Parthivi, signifying Parthian. It continued, however, to be applied not only to the alphabet which first appears in the early period of Parthian domination in Persia, but also to the later forms that developed under the Sasanian kings who succeeded the Arsacids, or Parthian kings. The so-called Zend alphabet was the latest of the Pethlevi, and appears during the later years of the Sasanian Empire. Although the latest development of the Persian scripts, the Zend alphabet represents the most ancient form of Persian speech. It was in these characters that some time during the Sasanian dynasty, the Zend Avesta, or Sacred Books of the Persians, were transcribed in the ancient speech of their origin, which have thus been preserved to the present day by the surviving representatives of this ancient faith. The language expressed in the Gathas, or hymns, the most archaic portions of the Avesta, is in the ancient vernacular of eastern Persia, sometimes called Old Bactrian, and is the most archaic of Iranian dialects. This was apparent when Sanskrit became known to European scholars. The striking resemblance of the Gathas to the older Sanskrit of the Vedic hymns indicated a close relationship. They seemed, indeed, like two dialects of the same speech. In fact, the readiness with which this old Persian was converted into pure Sanskrit by a few slight phonetic changes verified these indications. In the further comparative study of the older Sanskrit with this older Persian, it was found that while the Sanskrit may be regarded as the older brother of the Aryan group, this ancient Persian is in some respects more archaic. It nevertheless remains that the Sanskrit is, in the main, the elder representative of this family of languages, retaining the characteristic forms of phonetic structure once common to the whole family, with their meanings less changed, than any other branch of the Aryan group. It is this fact which enabled philologists to base a science of Aryan philology upon the Sanskrit, and not only this, but from which has arisen the science of comparative philology for all families of languages. Whatever may be said of the ethnic affinities of the Aryans, of their primitive home, this much has been made evident in the comparative study of the Vedas and the Avesta that there is close kinship here. They tell of a time not so remote in history as that of older Chaldea, or Egypt, when these Indo-Iranians were one people, with a common ancestry, inhabiting the same country, speaking the same language, with the same social institutions and the same beliefs. They indicate that the home of these Indo-Iranians, before their separation, was somewhere near the headwaters of the Oxus, to the northwest of the Hindu Kush. That finally there was a separation of these families, those afterwards known as the Hindus penetrating these great mountain passes into the Punjab. 
the land of the five rivers in the northwestern part of india from whence they spread southward over this great peninsula the other branch the iranians remained for a time north of the hindu kush in bactria which formed later on a part of the ancient empire of iran or persia on the northeast this country was situated in an upper valley of the oxus formed by the hissar mountains on the north and at the south of the hindu kush extending from the pamir plateau on the east to the great desert of chorasmin on the west a fruitful valley well watered affording on the hill slopes of the southern range favourable pasturage for flocks and herds from this region the iranian branch finally spread westward and southerly throughout the lands later known as iran or persia it has been suggested that the separation of the indo-iranians was the result of religious differences the schism indicated in the rig vedas and the avesta seems to have grown out of the distinction which finally arose between the signification of the words azura or ahura as applied to deity the earlier faith of these peoples seems to have been a pure nature worship the sun the sky light fire the elements throughout which appears also a spiritual conception of a supreme being lord of the sky the sun creator of all things who was known as asura or ahura the most ancient signification of this word is the broad and enfolding its earliest application as lord of the sky is perhaps a reminiscence of that remote period in the history of these people when they roamed the vast steppes of northern central asia in the spiritual conception which grew from this azura became the lord of the broad heavens the god of light the infinite the word diva from the sanskrit div signified brilliant shining in its spiritual sense the shining ones applied originally to the ministering spirits the bright messengers of azura from the word diva we have the word deus god divus divine demons and other similar forms in various branches of aryan speech at first azura is the most sacred name used for deity later on with the increase of gods in the hindu pantheon the term azura is conferred as a highest dignity upon the greater gods as azura varuna azura indra there came a time however as appears in the vedas when the asuras signified a class of spirits inferior to the divas and finally as spirits opposed to the gods as the azuras were degraded the divas were exalted with the iranian branch there was no such change the ancient azura in persian ahura remained from first to last their great divine one nor throughout the whole history of persian mythology are there any gods before him the word divas with them came to signify evil spirits devils that a schism arose is apparent and also that it was local hard by the believers in ahura says zoroaster dwell the worshippers of the divas such were the conditions when the great prophet and sage appears upon the scene not as the apostle of a new religion but as a teacher of the higher meanings of their ancient faith as priest and leader of the believers in ahura he strikes at once at the root of the dissension the worshippers of the divas are blind followers of the evil one who seek the souls of men to destroy them the hindus developed into gross polytheism the iranians grew into a monotheism at once all comprehending and simple a philosophy profound and yet without dogma a system of morality noble and true which has compelled the admiration of the wise and spiritual of all ages this was the work of zarathustra or zoroaster he pointed to the existence in all nature of two principles good and evil these were the offices of ahura mazda the all good and angromanyash the all evil in the regions of light the abode of ahura mazda there could be no contact between ahura mazda and the spirit of evil and of outer darkness in his wisdom ahura mazda the creator 
brought man into existence forming the earth for his abode he endowed man also with intelligence to perceive and freedom to choose between good and evil so far as his immediate actions were concerned as a natural consequence the earth became the arena of conflict between the powers of good and evil the object of both was the souls of men over those who chose purity of life who were pure and noble in all their dealings with others were just and merciful over these araman the evil spirit could obtain no mastery to the man impure in thought and action unjust dishonest and cruel the great god ahura mazda could not extend his protection and except through earnest and honest repentance his soul was doomed in the life to come to the service of the evil one and to final destruction on the other hand the man who followed the leadings of the god of goodness and wisdom was assured that at his death his soul passed to a state of eternal blessedness these sweet and reasonable doctrines included no taint of fanaticism while pervaded with the spirit of their founder they were never urged at the point of the sword in the thirtieth chapter of the yasna in which is preserved the celebrated speech of zoroaster to vistakpi and his court it is distinctly stated that the great prophet relied solely upon persuasion and argument in the account given by ferdusi of this occasion zoroaster is quoted as saying learn o king the rites and doctrines of the religion of excellence for without religion there cannot be any worth in a king when the mighty monarch heard him speak of the excellent religion he accepted from him the rites and doctrines the date of zoroaster is uncertain various authors assign him to different periods from two thousand five hundred to one thousand b c while others refer him to still remoter dates Ancatil du peron places him in the time of histaspes father of darius and bunsen at two thousand five hundred b c but scholars generally agree upon the period between fourteen hundred and one thousand b c at the date of darius five hundred and twenty one b c zoroastrianism was the national religion of the persians in one of the inscriptions of darius we find this reference quote, master who created this earth and that heaven who created man and man's dwelling-place who made darius king the one and only king of many End quote. This and other references in the inscriptions indicate the time of Zoroaster as before the date of Darius. Ancient Persian traditions represent Zoroaster as a native of Bactria, and that the important address to King Vistakpi and his court was delivered in the ancient city of Balk. Dr. Bunsen says of Zoroaster's conception that it was not less grand than that of Abraham but that the distinctive difference lay in these facts zoroaster attempted a conciliatory compromise between his stern antagonism to nature worship and the retention of the ancient rites and symbols of such worship abraham on the other hand excinded nature worship altogether and sought to banish it as utterly as possible from his religiously segregated society in this he urges the hebrew man of god stands above the Aryan from happy bactria this religion of excellence spread among the numerous tribes of iranians into all persia finally becoming the state religion this was also known from its earliest to its latest history as the book religion according to parsi tradition zoroaster was the author of the avesta which when first written consisted of twenty-one nosks or parts it is also stated that this book was in a form of writing invented by zoroaster and which the magar or priests of this cult called the writing of religion it was written on twelve thousand cowhides in ink of gold and the work was bound together by golden bands various greek writers who followed the wake of alexander's conquests in persia claim to have seen the original which was preserved in the archives of persepolis Traditional accounts state that there were two copies of this work, one of which was destroyed in the palace of Persepolis, which was burned by order of Alexander, and the other was destroyed by the Greeks in some other way. 
There were also copies of the various nosks or parts in the hands of the priesthood, which thus escaped destruction. After the death of Alexander, the Zoroastrian priests gathered the remaining fragments, putting them into book form. Five hundred years later, at the close of the Parthian dynasty in Persia, another collection of the Avesta fragments, both oral and written, was instituted at the command and under the patronage of King Vologases, the last of the Arasids, about A.D. 225. The work of editing and revising these collections was continued under the early Sassanian kings, with whom the ancient nationality again became ascendant, and with this the ancient Persian religion and its literature. The new Avesta thus produced was proclaimed canonical. Under the later Sassanian kings, the Avesta was transcribed in the later Pelevi, or Parsi script, in which form it has survived to the present day. Of this, however, but a portion remains. The Sassanian dynasty ended with the conquest of Persia by Mohammedan Arabs in 641 AD. In the fury of persecution which broke over all Iran at this time, Zoroastrianism as a national faith was crushed, and the sacred literature of Persia was again scattered abroad by the devastating influences of war and fanaticism. To the religion of Zoroaster, that of Muhammad succeeded. The Avesta was replaced by the Koran, and the Arabian alphabet supplanted the Persian as a national script, and has so remained to the present. The ancient national life of Persia was not crushed out at once, but continued a vigorous though ineffectual resistance for centuries. During these troublous times, probably about the ninth century AD, a colony of Persians who held fast to their ancient faith fled from the country, and after many years' wanderings finally established themselves on the western coast of India from Bombay to Surat. They brought with them the remains of their sacred literature, to which other missing portions were added from time to time, as they could obtain them from their brethren in the faith who remained in Persia, chiefly at Kerman and Yezd. They adopted the language of the Hindus, among whom they settled, but steadfastly maintained their religion and customs. It is from the descendants of these refugees, the Parsis of India, that the ancient sacred books of Persia have come into our hands. The Avesta, as it now exists, consists of four parts, the Yasna, the Visparad, the Vendidad, and the Kordash, or Little Avesta. Each of these parts are remainders of the older collection and are of different dates. The Yasna, a collection of hymns and prayers for divine service, includes the Gathas, the most ancient and sacred portion of the Avesta. These are evidently what they claimed to be, the work of Zoroaster. The language in which they are composed is as old, if not more ancient, than the Sanskrit of the oldest Vedas. The allusion to these hymns throughout the various parts of the Avesta shows them to have been in existence long before all other portions of these collections were written. Again, to all to whom Zoroaster is a living personality, the internal evidences of these utterances point distinctly to him as their author. Claiming no higher distinction than a teacher and preacher among his people, there could have been no time in the history of the religion of which he was the founder than during his own life and work in which they could have had their origin. These devout pleadings with the divine for his people, that he and they might be led aright, does not savour of the highest spiritual dignities according to Zoroaster in later times. The following quotation from the Gathas expresses very clearly the devout and reverent attitude of the author. Quote, with verses of my own making which now are heard, and with prayerful hands I come before thee, Master, and with the sincere humility of the upright man and the believer's song of praise. End quote. End of section 11. End of In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain.